Okay. Welcome to Uptown Rumble, heavy music in the Bronx. My name is Stephen Payne, director of the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is January 16th, 2024, and I'm really thrilled to be here with a couple members of a legendary Bronx uh, uh, thrash and death metal band, Hellbound. Uh, so we're going to get into all of the history of the band and the members of the band in a little bit. But before we do so, um, JD and Lou, why don't you just say like a sentence or two about yourselves? Hello, oh, my name is JD Valladares, Puerto Rican, born and raised in the Bronx. Actually grew up in Mount Eden for my first six years of my life, right there on Townsend Avenue, and actually moved uptown to Marble Hill Projects, and that's why I spent uh, most of my teenage years and stuff, and I am the vocalist. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you, J.D. Lou, what about you? Well, uh, I was born in the Bronx as well. I was born in a hospital called uh, Morrisania Hospital. I don't believe it exists anymore. I believe, from what I understand, is a woman's shelter, something like yeah, that. That's right. Um, I am the drummer for this wonderful band called uh, Hellbound. And uh, that's about it. All right. My, yeah, I, 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 as, I am a Puerto Rican descent as well. Um, we, uh, My folks moved to New York in, I, I want to say in their 20s. They both did. They met there and they married and I'm the first result. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Did they move? Did they move straight to the Bronx? Is that the first place yeah, they moved to New York? Yeah, they did. And do, they do met you know there. where they lived in the Bronx? Um, uh, Clay Avenue. The, well, oh, okay. My birth certificate says, um, it starts with an M, I can't remember right now. Yeah. But, um, you know, from my experience, my my memory, just Clay Avenue. Clay Avenue, yeah. 167th and Clay. Okay, okay. And we'll, we'll get more to your family in a second. Uh, J.D., what about your family? How did your family end up in the Bronx? Uh, my grandmother actually came from Bayamón, Puerto Rico. Uh, so she moved to the Bronx. And it's so ironic because she moved to Patterson Projects. And that's actually where my father met my mom. Awesome. And to make a long story short, uh, yeah, they ended up moving when they first got married. They were actually living at Hunts Point for a little while before they moved to Mount Eden. Yeah. And uh, like I said before, yeah, grew up there for my first six, seven years, and then we moved back uptown. But I never got a chance to know my real grandfather. I had a step-grandfather, but I really considered him my real grandfather because that's like the only abuelito that I knew. <laughs> um, the guy, rest in peace. Um, but, you know, that's pretty much uh, the journey for me. Uh, you know, been moving back and forth a lot lately over the last 20, 25 years. But that was uh, basically the two places where, you know, like I could say I did a lot of my growing up was uh, Mount Eden and uh, Marble Hill. All right. And, and Lou, what what about you? Which Which neighborhoods in the Bronx did you grow up in? Well, Clay for a while. You started on and, Clay, yeah. Yeah, I, I I was in Clay Avenue. I want to say from what when I, you know from any reasoning, I I remember Clay as a baby basically. Um, went to school nearby, fifty three. Went to one forty five, which is nearby, and then um I want to say that in two thousand not not two thousand nineteen seventy seven we moved to PR. So we lived in Puerto Rico. As a family, you know the typical. You know we built. You build a home above your grand. You know your 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 folks' home. Yeah. You know we. You know my folks build a. They built a uh, small little wooden house, and I lived in Puerto Rico for about. I want to say about seven years as a kid. Wow. And then the folks, you know, they go through their troubles in life, and then they get divorced, and we end up right back, right back in Clay Avenue. <laughs> right back in Clay Avenue, huh? I got back in Clay Avenue. Lived there for a couple of years, and then we moved to Franklin Avenue and 169th, which is where uh, the, one of the Bronx Lebanon hospitals is, very close to there. Yeah, yeah. And I lived there for a couple of years, through the high school years, and then I met my first wife, and then we moved to Soundview Projects. Okay, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, and I stood there till 2003 was when I moved away, and I ended up in uh, Central Florida. Okay, okay. Um, 
So uh, since since Ron, you for now, Lou, we'll stick with you. Then we'll go back to JD and get his answer to this. But why don't you um, talk a little bit about your experience in the school system? I mean, you know, moving back and forth, of course, but you can talk about the schools both in the Bronx and in PR. Well, in the Bronx, it, it was, um, like I said, 53, 53, um, CES 53. And then from that one, I went to uh, Community Junior High School 145. And from there, I went to Walton High School. I graduated from Walton High School. Um, the experiences there were great. I mean, um, I was lucky enough to be around some pretty decent uh, music programs in each school. 140, 140, uh, 145 had a really good, um, a really, really good music program. Uh, okay. we, we, you know, what we did was uh, cover a lot of um, shows you know, the, the theme songs to shows. We did songs yeah. like Rocky and like uh, SWAT, wow. stuff like stuff like that. I played the trumpet. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. That's what you played, huh? I still play all this junk. You know, I got I got my room with all my... Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that, that was your first instrument, the trumpet? My first instrument was actually the baritone horn, which is this oh, guy wow. right here. Except this is a marching, the marching baritone. Look at that. And so um, I played the baritone, but I wanted to play the trumpet really, really bad. I thought that I thought the baritone horn was like a nerdy instrument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wanted yeah. to play a cool instrument. I wanted <laughs> to play drums, but there was no drummer. The drummer, you know, the, the person that filled in on the drums was actually the director of the program in 145. Oh, so, wow. You know, and, and in those schools, theory was very secondary. The important thing sure. was a show. So theory never stuck, <laughs> you know, I don't, I can't read worth the crap. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. But, but and hey, it, you started developing chops at a very early age, huh? Yeah, I, my interest was always in drums, always from like, I don't know, seven years old, something like that. I'm actually the son of a singer. My dad um, was a singer in what we call is, is, is a very uh, typical type of island music. It's called trio music. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. You know what that is? I do, trio. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, he was part of a trio, which is odd because he was a singer that didn't play guitar. Most of the time when you see a trio, everyone's got a guitar in their hand. Uh -huh. But my dad, he played pretty well, but he didn't consider himself a, a guitarist. You know what I mean? He, he was just not comfortable playing guitar while singing, you know? Yeah. So he played at, you know, at, as just a vocalist. And that's why I picked up, you know, the love for music, you know? From a very early age, he was handing me, you know, Latin percussions and letting me kind of dabble in it. And I was always, you know, nosy, <laughs> you know, so I, I wanted to play something at some point. I knew I was going to be a musician. I knew that part. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, that's pretty much the, you know, the entire. Oh, I also did a uh, DCI, Drum Corps Incorporated, oh, which is okay. competition marching bands. Yeah. I did that. Um, I was in the New York Lancers. Okay, and what 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 you play? Did you play snare or? No, I actually was on the horn. I played a uh, soprano. Oh, okay. Oh, soprano. I see. oh nice. Yeah, soprano is nothing but a, a trumpet, but it's only got two valves as opposed to three. Wow. Same, same same scale, same everything, except you don't have that third last finger, the, the yeah you know, the ring finger. Um. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, the, the the very first real band I was a part of was Held Out. Wow, wow. And we'll we'll get to how all of that came together and, and how you all met in a second. Mm -hmm. But um just to just to stick with your musical formation a little bit before we get to JD, um, what all kinds of music would you hear in the household? I mean, obviously the music your father was playing in the trio, but yeah. what other kinds of music? It was pretty eclectic. I mean, my mom was listening to just about everything, R and B. Um, you know, she liked. Uh, she was a pretty decent fan of the Beatles. You know, and um, my dad as well. I mean, he didn't speak too much in the way of English, but he he can appreciate. You know, just just about every genre of, of music, and I learned that too. You know, yeah. um, it, every Saturday night it was planning day, <laughs> and you know the music was blaring. It could be whatever. Uh -huh. it could be just about anything. <laughs> You know, uh, romantic Spanish stuff. It could be some funk, you know. It could be just about everything. 
And, you know, we lived in a neighborhood where music was blaring everywhere. So you heard every genre, every bit. Absolutely. Every, it was it was pretty cool. Pretty cool now, growing how, up. How, how much on the streets was, was the music? I mean, as far as, you know, boom boxes or, you know, people's windows open, blaring oh, yeah. things. Like, All yep. day and every day, R&B, uh -huh. you know, the hip hop. You know, then came the break dancing era. I dabbled in that a little bit too, you know. Oh, um, nice. Uh, all of that. Um, I just, you know, I, I whatever. I, just, I, you know, I was one of those kids that was trying to keep myself out of trouble, you know. Yeah. And, you know, I was in a in a rougher neighborhood, and so I just was. I, I was trying to keep myself busy and not be in trouble. Sure. You know, my sure. mom made it very clear. You know, I will not visit you in jail. You will not get commissary. <laughs> <laughs> She was real clear on that. She was not trying to play around with that. I believe uh, that. So, so just for, uh, uh, I guess, um, uh, context of age and all, how old were you when you first moved to PR? And then how old were you when you moved back to the Bronx? I was seven when we moved to PR. And when I moved back to the Bronx, I was probably 11, closer to 12. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. I see. And um, the years you were in PR, what were those like for you? Um, it, it was a different, it was a different atmosphere. Obviously, you know, um, the tragedy is that you know when when you're in the island, you're not, you're not, you're no longer Puerto Rican. <laughs> yeah. you know, you're basically yeah. a green, you know, and uh -huh. so you gotta you gotta earn your respect and such and such, you know. And they they would treat me bad, but you know, I survived. <laughs> and 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 you went there right at the age where you know. <laughs> Boy, <Everything's awkward>. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Awkward, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I got into my fights over that, but you know, everybody I fought became my friend. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Um, and when you came back to the Bronx, what were your feelings about coming back to the Bronx? I mean, you remember? Yeah, I remember clearly that I wanted to stay with my dad. That was yeah. my butt, you know, me sure. and my mom. We we had our friction, you know, because uh, I was a daddy's boy. Let's put it like that. Yeah. You know, and so I was, you know, I, I begged and I pleaded, you know, can I stay with my dad? Can I, you know, I think I'm old enough to decide. I was already, you know, almost 12 years old, 11. Yeah. And I said, I want to stay with my dad if that's okay with you, mom. She's like, there's no way, no how. I said, why not? <laughs> she claimed that he wasn't responsible enough, that this and that, and, you know. I mean, and like I said, we're, we're talking about the typical Puerto Rico living, which is right above your, your you know, your, your grandparents. Sure. I said, Grandma's there, you know. I just, what's the problem? Just, yeah. Yo, wherever I go, you go, Mister. Wow. And my dad, you know, tried to plead my case for me too, and for his, for his you know, his case, and but no, no can do. <laughs> Didn't work out. Um... Didn't work. I ended up back in the Bronx, and good because I would have never met. You know the gentlemen that are my brothers in, in in arms and music. You know what I mean. That's right. That's right. Um, never met ever. Now, so. JD, what about you? As far as um, your experience in school, your kind of uh, the musical environment you grew up in. Those are both very rich topics that that Lou was touching on just now. So, um, so why don't you start us off there? Oh, absolutely. Let's see. As far as school. When we first moved to the projects in Marble Hill, my parents were not digging the schools in the neighborhood, bad rep, et cetera. So we did like everybody else did. We used another address and ended up going to elementary school. And I don't even know if it's still there. It's in Riverdale. At the time, it was called PS81 Robert J. Christian Elementary School. At the time, I mean, I'm talking about 1976. Predominantly white, predominantly uh -huh. Jewish. What so, do you remember that intersection? What's the intersection of that, if you remember? Oh my God, that's probably around maybe like two fifty eighth Street. Um, oh wow, it's way up there. Yeah, I don't even know if the seven bus still goes up there. I remember the seven and the ten bus used to go up there. I don't know what it is now. They, they do. I never, I never ride them up that far, but but they go way up there. <laughs> but it's definitely really past like Henry Hudson, past Fieldston. Um, really, really good school, but it was definitely a tough adjustment as far as you can count the number of uh, minority kids that went to that school. So I don't have to tell you the the constant fights, the 
you know, trying to tease um, the politics that go into certain things as far as, you know, I remember trying out for certain things, whether it was drama clubs or basketball teams. And I knew I was better than those kids. And, yep. you know, I would get passed over. Um, but overall, it was a good experience. I mean, the school was great. I had some really, really good teachers. Um, and then I just decided to stay up there. There was a junior high school, um, 141, which was, wasn't was too far away. I don't even know if that's there. And that was a crazy time. I mean, that was a time that I was kind of finding myself in, especially like sports wise and getting into girls and met some friends that I still actually keep in, keep in touch with until this day. Wow. Um, after that, I went to uh, John F. Kennedy High School, which I know is not there anymore. It's like split in. Believe like it or not, or yeah, it was. Yeah, it was sad. I I had no idea. I think at the time, if I'm not mistaken, I was living in Texas, and a couple of my friends had told me that I think first they turned into like an annex or a couple of pods, and then they just decided to shut it down. Uh, I wish I really wish I could sit here and say I enjoyed my high school experience. I mean, as far as meeting people and some great teachers, it was definitely a tough time in my life. It was a transition where my father was going through a lot of things. Um, parents uh, split up, I'd say probably maybe two years after we had moved to the projects. Sure. Um, my mother wanted us to, to live with her, but it was just a thing at the time. She just, we weren't wild as far as me and my brother. Um, but she just just couldn't handle it. And we really didn't want to be there, to be honest. My mother had like different agendas. We ended up moving in with my dad. And mm -hmm. as great as my dad was, and he's definitely the, the person that made me as far as sports and music and teaching me things, but kind of like the streets too much. And, you know, although he did have a job, but he was in and out the house, hardly home, got into some trouble, uh, ended up going to jail and really had no way to support ourselves. At the time, my grandmother, who I consider was like a mother to me, she was, I mean, number one in my life. And she started to get sick at the time. Um, it was just something we had to do. And I ended up dropping out of high school. Yeah. Uh, went to work and, you know, I wish I could say, hey, I went to my prom and, you know, did all those things in high school. And, you know, I did a lot, but it wasn't that school experience that a lot of people, you know, have. And it's definitely something I miss and which is unfortunate. Um, but that was basically, you know, my school years. Yeah, I got into a little trouble here and there. You know, nothing major, maybe one suspension, um, you know, a couple of fights. Uh, but. I mean, overall, it was a good experience in the Bronx. I mean, definitely a lot of stories that I could tell as far as, you know, friends that I met, things that we did. But uh, at 16, I dropped out of school. I mean, later on, got my GED and, you know, got my act together. But, yeah, I wasn't in high school too long, a couple of years, and that was really about it. Sure. Sure. And as far as um, music uh, that you're – family listen to or maybe that your friends listen to what kind of music were you exposed to uh, growing up boy let me tell you uh that's one thing i can say about mom and pops they were into everything uh pop culture music my mother was more into classical believe it or not nice so nice. she would be blasting opera records out the project window. So when you're hearing things like La Traviata, La Boheme, and people are like telling me, yo, what's your mom playing up there? And, yo, are you listen to that? And, of course, at the time, I didn't appreciate it. So I would just roll my eyes like, yeah, I don't know what the hell my mom is listening to, and I can't bother with that. Listen to a little R&B. She was never really into a lot of hip-hop or, or anything like that. Definitely into her doo-wop and 60s and classic rock. Yeah, my father was the one. He played anything and everything. I mean, of course, he loved his salsa and merengue, but he was the one that would play the early Earth, Wind, and Fires and mm -hmm. Curtis Mayfield, just all kinds oh. of R and B. Right. wasn't really too much into the hip hop, but he was the one that was always throwing me records. Hey, here's mm -hmm. Jimi Hendrix, here's Zeppelin, here's Sabbath. Mm -hmm. 
And I would just sit there and just say, wow, man, this is just absolutely amazing. And I remember there was an old store back in the day. I mean, it's not there anymore. It's called Corvettes. Yeah. And I actually found, oh, I should say found, I actually bought my, my first quote unquote metal album there. And it was Kiss Dressed to Kill. Just because oh, I saw them okay. on the front, they just looked like, wow, like who is this? And slowly but surely, that's how I started to like progress and just get into more bands and try to discover things. And and my father was just always one metal magazines. He's like, oh, I don't know if you like this, but you know, I picked this up for you. Or I don't know if you like this band. Like I remember when he first came in with the first self-titled Iron Maiden album. And my brother and I were just staring at the cover, like, oh my God, this is this is amazing. <laughs> the art, and, right? Yeah, that's basically how we got into music. But I gotta give my pops all the credit in the world because that was just his thing. Just had his tech techniques turntable. We weren't allowed to touch it. Don't touch my album collection. Because <laughs> my brother just loved scratching records on his needle. Oh, and <laughs> oh, back then I can't tell you, my father, forty dollars for a needle, he used to have a heart attack. So, that's a lot where was Corvettes? There's <laughs> a ton of money back in those days, bro. Yeah, Jake, oh, uh, where, where was Corvettes located? The music store. Wow, I actually got lucky. We had a music store, I'd say probably three blocks down from where we lived. It was called Broadway Records. Oh, okay, I forgot the guy's name, I know he passed many years ago, but. I don't know. He just used to get everything. Yeah. And, you know, in the beginning, I wasn't buying a lot of metal records. It was really a lot of top 40 and R&B stuff. And right. so one day he said, hey, I got a distributor and I got a whole bunch of metal records. And just started, my brother and I just started looking through them. And next thing you know, we just started discovering groups and you know, just taking chances. Uh, you know, you look at the cover and say, oh, wow, the cover's amazing. The group has to be awesome. And yeah, I'd say six times out of 10, yeah, that was the case. And then the other ones, they, they would just go and, you know, straight back into the closet and never listen to again. But um, the one person I got to give credit to is my best friend in the world, which we uh, still talk to this day, is when he came to my door with Metallica's Kill Em All. Uh -huh. And that's what changed everything for me. I, I didn't know that band existed. Um, we went to the same junior high school and he was hanging out with a lot of metalheads at the time. And myself, I was just too much into sports and the girls. And he was just like, hey, you got to listen to this metal band. He's like, they like like Iron Maiden on steroids. They're really aggressive. And sure enough, put it on. And I was hooked. And from that day on, I I just had a thirst to just find new bands. And as they got heavier and heavier and. Yeah, that's how it started. So shout out to Kevin Christopher for bringing Kill 'Em All and uh, Slayer, uh, Show No Mercy, because wow. that's that's what really got me going, you know, into heavier bands and into the scene in general. What 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 year was that uh, that you got introduced to Kill 'Em All and Show oh, No Mercy? Oh, it's got to be oh, 1983. Okay, so like right when they came out, then you you were on it. Huh? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and that's how I slowly but surely was like, wait a minute, there's got to be more bands out here like this. This can't be the only ones. So slowly but surely, I tried finding out about the quote unquote, the undergrounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Wow. Uh, Lou, what about you? What was your introduction to heavy music? You know, it's funny. I got introduced to heavy, heavy music really late. It was like, I want to say my sophomore year of high school. Yeah. Yeah, it was late. I mean, not as early as Jay. Um, I got introduced to them. How I think it was a, I think it was like a, some underground stuff. I don't remember the name of the band. I know one of the one of the bands I got introduced to by by my my buddies that you you, you know JD knows, like the Crazy Eddies, all those cats. Um, was uh Mucky Pup. Mucky Pup is a is a like a punk kind of a hardcore kind yeah. of a band. And then I, I call them a joke band because you know yeah. they they just kind of diss everybody. Yeah. Um. What else? There was some other stuff that that I got introduced. To. That's when I got introduced to like the um Anthraxes and the Slayers and um uh the Maidens, Iron Maiden, Metallica, Megadeth, yeah, uh, Overkill, 
Um, I think, you know, my my musical kind of knowledge got way bigger when I met Jay and, and Scotty and and Aaron. You know, yeah. when I met those guys, that's when, you know, I, I started really, really learning about what's out there. I didn't really know. Um, yeah. I think, and then um, what united us, I don't know if, if I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I think what united us was a band called Sepultura. Oh, Sepultura sure. From Brazil. They, that's sure. the band that, that kind of glued us together. That makes yeah. sense. That I makes sense. Elaborate more because he remembers dates and everything else more than me. But that was the band. That was I want to say between that band and probably like a Sodom. I don't remember what else we were listening to, but I think that was it. That's when everything started. We we basically covered the entire album that they they released. The first album they released, which was uh, Beneath the Remains. Beneath the Remains. That's a killer album. Yeah, and um, yeah, we 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 tried to play it. I mean, you know, no, none of us had the skills like like you know we 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 got better as we went along. But I mean, there was one song in particular which I think was beneath the remains that we played pretty tight. We played pretty good, and so that's how that's how it started with us, you know. And we didn't think much of it, you know. We were just jamming, quote unquote, jamming, and then you know more members i think i think it's, i don't remember if jay was there from the very beginning or he came later i know that i met with aaron first i met aaron first how'd you I meet him um he i don't know how he came about but he ended up coming to i was staying with my with a buddy of mine it yeah. was like we used to call it the orphanage <laughs> we all lived there you know <laughs> and we had we, we had we even had a drum riser in the house our neighbor <laughs> despised us and somehow Aaron ended up going there. I don't know how I connected with Aaron, but someone in the in the group knew Aaron, and Aaron was was uh, invited, and he came over, and that was pretty much the beginning. Where, where of was the uh, where was the orphanage located at? Mount Eden. When Jay said Mount Eden, I I almost flipped out because it was in Mount Eden. Mount that's Eden. crazy. Yeah, that's crazy um, as hell. Jay, Jay, did when you did you ever visit? I stood up. Mount Eden. <laughs> you live there. That's crazy. Um, so you met Aaron, and then through Aaron, you met Scotty and JD, and yeah, that's kind of how you got Scotty, connected. Scotty and JD, I think, came on the second visit. I think they came together, and everybody was there. I believe, you know, my memory doesn't really serve me right sometimes, but I think that's what I, that's how it was. It was first Aaron, and then JD and Scott showed up, and we would just jam. We would just jam on anything, whatever you know whatever just covers you know and but it was good people were like man you know that sounded pretty good you and know? How, how old how old were you at the time i'm sorry how old were you at the time i want to say about 18 about 18 okay 18. yeah yeah yeah, I, I definitely gotta add to that story because um, um, unless i'm losing my mind right now this this is the, the story i remember I remember Aaron telling me that he was going to go hang out with a bunch of guys and they were actually going to go to Lou's house. Now, one of the guys, he wanted to start a band. His name was Joey, Joey Rodriguez. He wanted to start a hardcore punk band. Okay. So Aaron is over here telling me that, oh, yeah, Joey was jamming out with Lou for a little while. You know, they were all hanging out in the apartment. And then all of a sudden, like, Aaron grabbed the guitar and was like, oh, yeah, can I jam out for a few? And I guess Louis was just like, oh, snap. Like, I, he hadn't really heard anybody, you know, like, play like that. Mm -hmm. And they just started jamming out. And the next thing you know, I guess Aaron and Louis just looked at each other and was like, yo, we, we, we're going to have to do this again because, you yeah. know, it, it just sounded so, so amazing, so perfect. And it was just what it was. And all I remember was Aaron coming back to the block and he was just, dude, Oh my God, I think we got a drummer, man. I think we got a drummer. Yo, this guy's freaking amazing. He listens to all the stuff we listen to. And I said, get the hell out of here. No way. And he's like, I'm serious. And then he told me where they were from. And I'm like, nah, stop playing. And <laughs> sure enough, I probably say a week later, I go up with Aaron. I meet Lou. I meet Eddie, Rude, uh, Hotiti. I meet all the guys. Didi's house. Didi's house. Oh, my God. So it was absolutely amazing. We're just there hanging out. We're just there. So I think Lou says, hey, let's jam out for a little while. So I'm like, all right, hey, man, I don't have a microphone. 
what we ended up doing was we took a Radio Shack recorder. We put a freaking blank cassette in there. I'm kneeling on my knees. Aaron's sitting on a sofa playing guitar. Louis playing the drums. And we just sat there and we jammed out songs. How wow. they came out, I, I, I just can't believe it. It was just something that was meant to be. I mean, the timing, I mean, everything was just, and believe it or not, we actually took that tape, which was 18 songs, and that's that got circulated into the underground before we went into a studio and actually recorded our first official demo. Wow. Wow. Did you just refresh my memory on Joey, bro. You just refresh my memory. I can't remember him. He, he could be standing right next to me right now. <laughs> but I remember the name. <laughs> I remember the name. He got <laughs> mad after that, man. He disappeared. He got yeah. all butt hurt because you never saw him at shows or anything after that. So, yeah. what was his last name, bro? Yeah, Rodriguez. He had that Tell long, curly him. black hair with the glasses. Yeah. He always had the yeah. Doc Martens on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wow. I, I don't know. I don't know where Beneath the Remains came from, but I, I, Aaron, I think asked me, "You ever heard of this band?" You know, how he talks. <laughs> you ever heard of this band? I was like, "Yeah, yeah." I just got. I just. I'm mad into them. They're freaking amazing. Like, well, I know the riff. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and it, that was that was it. That was it. And, oh, Jay, you remember the 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 bass drum? The double bass. Oh yeah, pedal. two, two oh, bass yeah. pedals on one drum. And I, and oh, you've had two bass pedals on one I, drum, huh? I will play on one drum, two bass pedals, <laughs> and the snare on the side like this. <laughs> it was crazy. Cramping up and whatnot. Wow, yeah. Lou, Lou, how how did you end up in in moving into the orphanage? Is there a story behind that, or? Well, um, you know, going back to to how my mom and I, and I always had friction. I love her. She gave birth to me. I, you know, I want the best for her and I will sure. look out for her, but she was pretty mean mom. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah. You know, she, she was very controlling. She, if she, if it were up to her, I would have never went outside. You know, it's so dangerous out there. I said, mom, I go to school. Remember? Yeah. You know? So I just did everything. I, I did everything in my power not to be home. You know? Yeah. I did everything in my power not to be home. And, and you know, that's tragic, but it's, it's a fact, Sure. you know? And so because of that, I moved out of my house early. I was, you know, I, at 16, first I was um, helping the super of the building. So he let me stay there. He had, he had a, you know, one small two bedroom apartment downstairs. Yeah. He would let me stay there in exchange for helping him out with the building. You know, I was you know, I was shoveling coal, I was cleaning, mopping, sweeping the building, you know. I own a handyman company now and I and I and I give him, you know, tons of credit because I learned a lot of stuff, you know, sure. just managing the building with him. And um then after that I, I I met my first wife and then I moved in with her. So I've been out of my house since about sixteen years old. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. You know, if, if eventually before I, I moved in with my mom you know, all of, of the musicians just put whatever little monies they had together and, and help DD out. And we all stayed there. It's wow. like bodies everywhere. <laughs> we wow. look like music. we have bodies everywhere, you know, and <laughs> every, music every day, music every single day. And the neighbors all piss off. And, <laughs> you know, we buy them. We buy them with freaking, you know, some weed or some, you know, once in a while, you know. And you know, but they they had short memories. So they they be banging on the ceiling. You know, you son of a bitch, you saw that shit. But you know, we were rude. We were doing that shit till about one o'clock in the morning. You know, on a Thursday. So we were rude. for sure. <laughs> we um, were were they kids you knew from high school at first before no, you met? No, the the only one I I knew from high school was um Ernie. Jay, okay. you remember Ernie, right? Oh yeah, um, Ernie Lopez. Yeah, the one that introduced me to Crazy Eddie, to Dee Dee, to all those cats. He was the one. He said, wow. "You gotta come, man. You gotta come to to this place, man. You would love it. You would freaking love it there. There's there's drums there. There's guitars there. There's even you know. Eventually, we even got mics. Wow. You know, and you gotta go there. You gotta you gotta you know just rocks off over there. You know. I said, I right, bet. And when I went, man, I was like, holy shit, this this is like paradise. <laughs> you know. 
So that's how it started. Wow. That's so, exactly how I started. So at least at least in some respects that that apartment spawned Hellbound. Are there other bands that came from that group? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. What, yeah, what other definitely. bands came from out of from out of that? I, I can't I can tell you their names, but there was one. I forgot what they wanted to name that band. It was a stupid name. That's why I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've all I been there. The <laughs> it was, uh, it was um, yeah, I don't remember. Willie. Jay, you remember Willie, the guitarist? We called him Baby Hendrix. <laughs> if I probably saw his face, I'd definitely yeah, recognize him. Right. I'm so bad with yeah. names. Dominican kid, yeah. And then his brother, uh, his, his brother Rob played the bass. Um, but, uh, he, he, you know, he, he, he was in some pretty high level band at one point. Cause he, he was a badass guitarist. I mean, the guy could play anything, any genre and he had chops, man. You know, the kid had chops. And so, um, but I don't remember the, the name of his band. Sure. Was, sure, uh, sure. Weird, something strange, but you know, a couple other little, I, I don't, I don't want to say bands, but a lot of musicians left there and joined, you know, other, you know, other situations that, that fit them. Sure. Sure. And, um and and JD, what was going on like in the Marble Hill Kingsbridge area as far as were there other bands that played, you know, similar kinds of music or or, or were y'all the only ones playing? Oh my God. Uh, you, you would hear people say, Oh, I have a band, I have this, and hey, give me a tape or I'll pass by for a rehearsal. Nothing. Yeah, <laughs> you would see the the, the, the metalheads in my well. First of all, where I lived in the projects, uh, the only metalheads that were around there lived in the building I lived in. There was probably like two. Yeah. Uh, of course, growing up in that neighborhood, you know, metal was absolutely shunned. Yeah, yeah. Uh, First in my side, I, I tell you, every time I blast it out my window, you hear all oh, these white boys and why are you playing this? Why are you into this? But. You know, like one minute I can play Slayer and the next minute I'm playing Wu-Tang or whatever was that, you know, at the time, you know, for hip hop, EPMD or, uh, you know, whatever the case may be. I, you know, yeah. I, I just loved music and it was just so hard finding metalheads. Really wasn't like a like a meetup or anything of the sort. My best friend, Kevin, he knew most of them, but they went to the uh, the middle school at the time. And that was a grade ahead of him. So I really didn't see him a lot. It would just be like in pa passing all. So Kevin would tell me, oh, these are the guys that I was telling you about. So, of course, they would wear like their leathers or they cut off jean vests. And mm -hmm. we had a, a friend of ours by the name of Joey. He was pretty good uh, as far as with drawing and art. And in the back of the jean vest, he would always like draw like band covers or logos of other bands. So, you know, I would always see him and say, yo, man, that's pretty cool, man. I'm going to have to like go invest me in a leather one day. I mean, of course, I was poor and I couldn't afford shit, but um, that was definitely something that, uh, you know, I wanted to do. But as far as bands, the only one, and they weren't local, they were living in Manhattan at the time, I'd probably say 174th, somewhere in Washington Heights. They started off as a band called Broom Helda, oh, yeah. which later on they disbanded. But one of the guys, his name is Las Pina, Really nice guy. I talk to him every once in a while, but he actually moved on into a band called El Nino, which uh, I'm not nope. saying that they got up to uh, great heights, but yeah, they, you know, they put out a bunch of albums and they toured, and they've done a I bunch remember. of things. And, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm happy for him because it's something that he always wanted to do. But yeah, as far as my neighborhood and the, the adjoining neighborhoods, to be honest, nah, really not a lot of metalheads. Yep. That I had to go to Manhattan to uh, Greenwich Village for. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I th I think I remember you mentioning, J.D., maybe a couple times ago when we talked uh, that you that you heard Cruciform uh, in the in the Bronx. Did you ever hear Cruciform? Maybe I'm misremembering. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I don't. It's funny. My brother kept all of my metal, whether it's demos, LPs. There was a show that came on Saturday nights from 12 to 6 called Midnight Metal. Uh, WRTN 93.5. That was one of the underground stations that I used to listen to. And believe it or not, they actually played it on the air. And when the host, his name was Matt O'Shaughnessy, and he said, oh, Cruciform from the Bronx. And I said, wait a minute. 
<laughs> are you kidding me? So that kind of like blew my mind, you know, hearing them not only over the radio, but a, a metal band. And they were like, uh, I mean, as far as I remember, a little thrashy. Yeah. Um, But that literally blew my mind. Just a metal band from the Bronx. I mean, I know at the time Demolition Hammer was out. Um, but I know a couple of the guys were kind of back and forth from Yonkers. And I really never saw them like a lot. I know Vinny lived in Yonkers. Yeah. Um, I knew one of his relatives. Um, matter of fact, I used to work with her when I worked at Truman High School years ago. And I know he had lived with Yonkers in a while, but yeah, that's how I discovered Cruciform. And I don't really remember how they how I got their demo. I'm assuming I wrote to them and they sent it to me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's how I found out about them, believe it or not. And uh JD, I know I know you were really into the scene as far as tape trading and all of that goes. Lou, was that was that your thing at all? Did you do a lot of that ever? Not really. No, no, no. I, I you know, I, I was always pretty busy. You know, I, I had a lot of things going on. You know, I, like I said, I, I my thing was to be as busy as possible on on you know on a on a positive side of things so oh, that sure. I stay out of trouble, basically. Sure. You know, prove to my mom that, you know, I could be in the street, not necessarily doing the dirty, dirty, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Cadet Corps, um, you know, DCI, whatever, whatever. I did it all, yeah. you know, <laughs> just to just to stay away from the house and but still try to be <laughs> on a positive setting, you know? For sure. Yeah. Um, and and JD, why don't you talk some about your, your tape trading years and uh and you know kind of the height of your activity there and everything that you're into maybe the furthest furthest away that you wrote to as far as you know band i don't know if you did international or not but but talk oh yeah. yeah oh without question uh definitely have to give shout outs to those radio shows whether it was uh wsou um that was a uh, seton hall pirate radio they actually had an underground show and wnyu they had two crucial chaos, and I forgot the name of the other show, but they they're the ones that got me into a lot of bands that I had never heard of. And I was very curious about that. So what I would do was I would go to Greenwich Village and there was a famous record store called Bleaker Bobs, which is mm-hmm. not there anymore. And that's where I picked up of uh, a, a lot of lot of LPs, a lot of vinyl, a lot of fanzines, uh, lots of demos. Um and in those fanzines, I would get a lot of addresses. But the first band I actually ever wrote to, I was listening to WRTN. There's a band called Wehrmacht, Vedmark. They're from Portland, Oregon. And they were just a crazy schizophrenic thrash band way ahead of their time. The musicians were absolutely amazing. And on their first album, Shark Attack, you'll actually see my name in the thank you list. And that came out in 1986. <laughs> wow. So now I'm just like, wait a minute, there's tons of bands out here, tons of people, tons of contacts. And I would just get an envelope, some stamps, write to these bands, uh, send money in the mail. And we would just trade everything, you know, from shirts to demos to fanzines to weed. to (laughs) I mean, you name it, we did it all. And yeah, it was overseas, whether it was Brazil, Russia, Holland. I mean... You know, there were certain things that they couldn't get over here and vice versa. So we say, hey, you know what? I'll pick up the shirt for you. Let's trade. And yeah, it was it was a great time. I, I mean, I remember just being so poor where we couldn't afford stamps and we would cut the corners of the stamps and dip them in alcohol. Uh-huh. So some of the postmark would come off and then afterwards just glue them right back to another envelope. I, you know, it was I know we were sick, but I mean, that's the way we did it. And it was just just a real genuine fun time in the underground. And especially a lot of the bands that are still around to this day, um, you know, you would see him come up. Um, my brother has so many letters, so many original demos from a lot of the great bands that we grew up with. And, you know, it was cool. It just it just was a real genuine time in the scene. Oh, Wow. And what about um? We'll we'll get a lot more into Hellbound here here in a second, but just one one more question before we do um get into Hellbound. Uh, uh, what about live music? Um, 
when did the two of you all start going to shows? If you all went to too many um, as you were getting into the scene and all. Wow. I'm pretty sure my first show, if I'm not mistaken, I was a little late to that. I mean, I would go to little local stuff and it wasn't really even like thrash band, but I probably say my first real legit, legit show was a famous club in Brooklyn called Lamore's that ah, had sure, sure. Oh, every single band. They had the best shows, hands down. Mm-hmm. It was a pain in the ass to get there. Two trains, mm-hmm. especially in the winter time when, mm-hmm. oh my God, you're going back home. It's two, three in the morning and you're waiting on a train platform for an hour and it's like 10 below. But yep. I think that my first show was, it was Testament, Violence, and God, the other band escapes me. And... I was hooked. Wasn't I, I mean, just seeing Chuck Billy, the the vocalist from Testament, he had such a a stage presence. The way he commanded, he was a real big guy, and that was at the time where Testament was just, I mean, absolutely amazing. Uh, their first two albums, uh, I mean, I still listen to them every once in a while, and yeah, I probably say between that and there was a video that had came out maybe a few years before that it was called the ultimate revenge and it had slayer exodus and venom on it oh wow but when i saw slayer and tom Araya, who was the vocalist of uh slayer yeah and i just saw what he did and i it just got me hooked and i really never like thought i would ever be in a band just cuz where i lived and i didn't know anybody and i just didn't know how to go about it but those were kind of a couple of guys that I saw, and I was like, "Wow, man! That it just—it it would be something to even just play one show like that one day in front of people, and just the crowd and the atmosphere." And yeah, the, the, it, it was just something that you know I had thought about, but just never thought it would come to fruition. And what for, for those first shows you were going to? Um, was there very much of a pit in those shows, and did you? Did you uh, join the pit when you went oh, there? Let me. T- oh my god! I tell you, I don't know how they are now. I mean, I see some videos, and it's not even a pit anymore. It's it's the basically band's people band's going band. up to one another and punching them in the face and kicking <laughs> them. Uh-huh. But I'll tell you, back then there were some violent pits, and I remember seeing people going there with chains and razors and mallets and box cutters and i'm sitting there saying what the fuck is going on (laughs) i'm supposed to get in that shit right now and and you know there was some nice pits you know don't get me wrong well yeah you get punched and kicked i mean it's all part of the territory but there was just some shows i went to with just guys were just looking for trouble and when you're just there with a couple of people and there's like 20 or 30 of them but there were times they believe me when i would go with a lot of people and then I'd say to myself, okay, good. I'm going to go into the pit because if I get cut, you know, at least, you know, we got a little backup when it's all said and done. But, <laughs> you know, some of these shows used to go to, these guys used to, you know, roll deep and, you know, you got to fight your battles and, you know, live to fight another day. So, yeah, mm-hmm. they, they were definitely some violent pits back in the day. I remember anytime there were, there were like skinheads involved, there was going to be a lot, a lot of fighting. Mm-hmm. A lot. Yep. Oh yeah, those hardcore yeah, shows. Exactly. Oh, forget it. Yeah, they were definitely going there looking for trouble, but they yep. respected. It. I remember real clearly that they were like, "Look at us and be like, okay, okay, you know, you guys are down for yours, you know." And and I remember at least in one instance, they were they were looking for trouble, but they look they saw that we weren't really scared and we were going in there, and they were actually giving us props, like, "Okay, you guys are savage too, no problem." So, right, no, but for the most part, yeah, I, I see that. I see people get, you know taken right out like you know big boys target the little guy just to crush him you know Uh um and lou what about what about your first shows yeah i remember um i think one of my earlier shows where i i may have been at that same concert that he's talking about testament and who'd you mention jay yeah it was testament exodus and man i don't even remember like the, the the opening band to be honest was it exodus by any chance you said exodus yeah, it was Testament it's Exodus, crazy. but I, I'm trying to, and it was like a known band that, oh, violence. 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 Yeah. So it was a Bay Area show. Yeah, okay. that was the opening violence. band, Violence, man, Eternal Nightmare. 
I love violence, man. And that man was like very, like very chaotic, very fast, but super tight. Super tight. Yep. I got to some fills that were like incredible and like yeah. no time. <laughs> Done. You know? Okay, so, I know, right? Yeah, then later on, uh, Machine Head. Yeah, Machine Head. Um, um, so you, you were at that show, Lou, you think? I was definitely at that show. Wow. Yeah. One with, cool. Al, with a boy of mine that's that's uh he's retired Marine. He you know, and uh I think when he when he finished um this this was one of I, I believe that was one of the first shows. What year was that, Jay? You remember? 88. 88? Yeah, definitely. No, no, it, it couldn't have been it was so it must have been right before he left because we graduated right around the same time, 88. Um, and so and that's when I met everybody. That's when I met everybody, and that's when I started. This whole thing, going wow. to shows, I was in awe. I was like in awe of the pit. I was in awe of the music. I mean, it was crazy. I was like, wow, this is powerful. Wow. This is so powerful. I mean, you, 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 I mean I've mean, i been to all kinds of shows, but nothing can move you like that. I mean, not much anyway, you know, not much. I was like, this is powerful, man. <laughs> I want to be involved with this right here. <laughs> <laughs> wow wow so getting getting to hellbound um how did y'all come up with the name let's just start there very basic wow um, i believe you remember that you remember that the the first name was procreation right mm -hmm. that, that was the first name we, we yep. know, aaron and I, come up, I think it was aaron and i come up with that and yep. i have no idea where hellbound came from i think it was from the love you guys had for for the clyde barker stuff that's exactly what it was. We had uh, opening night. We went to the RKO to go see uh, Hellraiser 2 Hellbound. Of course. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes, 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 of course. So there's a, a whole bunch of us. We're, we're tripping on that Sheet Meadows Central Park acid. <laughs> so we're losing our minds. So we're in there. We watch the movie. Everything's great. We're walking back home. And I just looked at Aaron. I turned on. And I said, "You know what? Let's uh, let's not even make it complicated. Let's just call the band Hellbound." So Aaron was like, "Hey, that sounds good to me. You know, we'll talk, go talk to Lou and and Scott. And hey, let's you know, let's do this." Unfortunately, throughout the years, then you had a bunch of Hellbounds pop up here and there, which yeah, you know, it's totally sucked. So every time we had to say like Hellbound New York City or Hellbound Bronx, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what? I, I mean, at the time when we were doing our thing, like I guess the, all the other Hellbounds got pushed to the side because then you wouldn't hear anything else about them. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, they, pop up, they pop up on YouTube, and and I, and I try to give them a listen, but there, there's nothing really, you know, that stands out about them. I mean, you know, it's rather bland if you ask me. Some of the stuff that that they do is it's kind of like. It's kind of like an imitation of what, something you had heard already. Yeah. You know, I think one of the things that, that, that I love about our outfit is that we're pretty unique. You know, we have a mixture of all of our musical backgrounds in there. I mean, you know, I've, I've had people tell me that they hear the Latin in me as I play drums and metal. And yeah. that's a compliment to me because I'm giving, you know, I'm giving the roots, you know, their props. Absolutely. And so that's a compliment, you know, um, but uh, yeah, that's basically you know that's basically it right there. So, so you made you made a demo pretty early on in the Mount Eden apartment. Uh, does that is that is that a demo that that y'all gave a title to and all of that, or it was just circulating underground? What was the name of that? It was matter of fact, it was eighteen songs. It's uh, it was the one way. Just one day we were. At Lou's house for probably about four or five hours, Aaron would start a riff. And the amazing thing about it is that, I, I mean, Aaron and Lou, just, I mean, clicked. I, I, I mean, you just, you can't make this up. I mean, just the, the timing and everything. These were just songs that were just made up, made up off the top of our heads. It wasn't a thing where... Yep. Aaron Where's gave Louie a riff and said, oh, okay, you know, here's the riff and I'll come back next week and then we'll work on stuff. We were just going through songs like like nothing and got song titles. And I actually took that tape 
And I know Aaron Lou, you're like, what are you crazy? You're gonna put that into the underground? We're taping this in the living room. It sounds well, like shit. Sounded horrible. <laughs> and I said, nah, what this is gonna get our name out until we get the money together and we're gonna go into a real studio. So it was actually called Darkness into the Unconscious. Oh, okay, yeah. that's Darkness into the Unconscious. Yeah. And I actually got somebody from the neighborhood. Uh, his name was Matt Labuda, and he drew us like a demo cover and made copies, and we sent them out. And you know, believe it or not, you know, everybody would say, "Yeah, the production sucked," but I can hear the music, I can hear the talent, and they were looking forward to a uh, studio demo, which then came out two years later in uh, '91 with Apocalyptic. Jay, tell me you got a copy of that, bro. That what? Tell me you got a copy of that. Man, I wish. Oh, I man. you know how many times man, I can tell you song titles. I remember the riffs. I remember, but man, I wish I had a copy. We got, I mean, I that know. was just that, that was like one of the best times ever, man. Yeah. Wow. I mean, if you remember the riffs, brother, we gotta we gotta bring at least some of those riffs back. That's you right. Mean, I, you know what I, mean? I tell that to Aaron all the time. I said, God, those those riffs are like timeless. They've never been used. I don't even hear them now. So, wow. I mean, hopefully. <laughs> but yeah. I swear, you I, Aaron, you can give me one of the, the song titles off of that, man. I already know the riffs, man. I mean, I know crazy, bro. <laughs> wow. Once you kind of like kind of sing them out to me, so to speak, you think Aaron remembers? <sighs> Yeah, I don't know, man. Yeah, I don't I even think I remember what he freaking ate for breakfast this morning, man. <laughs> J JD, did you make up the lyrics to those songs like on the spot too? Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> it's funny at the time, uh, and I know you're probably familiar with the band. They're from Florida. Um, they used to be called Executioner, and they changed their name to Obituary. Sure, sure, sure. Of course, yeah. So they came out with a classic album. Their first album was called Slowly We Ride. Huh? And John Tardy basically just said he went into the studio and he just growled whatever he thought. That's right. I remember reading that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I said, you know what? You know, I'm not going to sit here and, you know, OK, guys, can you wait like a couple hours while I jot down a paragraph of lyrics? <laughs> I just got on my one knee and I was like, all right, whenever you guys are ready and whatever came out of my mouth, that's exactly where it uh, what happened. <laughs> and then when I got home, I just said, all right, let me just put uh song titles to this and then little by little i started putting lyrics because then i knew that we were gonna have to like do this for real in a studio yeah yeah but yeah that's that's basically how it came about it's amazing. Wow. that's amazing wow <laughs> um how how many copies of that tape did, did you make i mean it'd be amazing if we could find a copy oh god i couldn't you know i made so many copies i taped <laughs> over so many cassettes uh I tell you, I kept Radio Shack in business for a while. Um, <laughs> I mean, that had to be at least a couple of a hundred. I can't say there were a lot, but there's got to be a couple out there. Uh, something that I probably have to go back to my old contacts and say, oh, my God, I know it's probably, uh, you know, at the bottom of the barrel right now, but <laughs> probably the garbage. Man. Man. Um, so was that was that 88 when that? when y'all made that demo then uh 89 i would say 89. okay it was like later 88 or early 89 something like that. yeah something like that okay wow so y'all y'all are all like 18 19 something like mm -hmm. that yeah wow. yep um yeah. and you know a couple years of course down the line you make another demo but between the two demos uh did you all start performing uh live at all yet in that period God. Lou, let me ask you something. Was the archway first? The archway in? I think we yeah. just for that, like a like an event, like an I, I don't know if it was a bar or somebody's house. Remember we oh did like a God. I think it was that was our first show. Party. It wasn't an official show in an official place. It was somebody's house or somebody's yard or something like that. Something Ooh. crazy. God. Yeah, yeah, we got together and we did like four songs and left. Wow. We played some yep. equipment. You know, it wasn't even in my own stuff. I don't even think I had anything because I think at the time that we got together, that was Didi's equipment. I didn't have drums. That was Didi's stuff. Look at that. So I think I think we did. I think we, we I, when I finally got, could it be when I finally got a set, we did that? Or Didi lent me his shit? I don't remember. 
But I know okay. we did like a, like a like a backyard thing, somebody's birthday, you know, it was like real impromptu. Yo, um, there's, there's gonna be some some stuff over there, or or there was people playing and we sat in something like yeah. that. Was that in the Bronx? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that was in the Bronx. Yeah, 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 yeah. Look in your neighborhood, Jay. Oh my some, God! One of your friends, one of y'all's friends. That's funny. Uh, unless God was that Ian's house. It could be. That sounds like it. Ian probably, Ian. man. That's that one of Scott's boys, Ian. Because he's yeah. the only one probably that had that little backyard at the time. Yeah. Oh, like like in, in Kingsbridge, like some of those like two or three family homes with like little backyards. Yeah, stuff. like yes, like going down like Corlear and stuff like that, like 234th, 238th. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, I think it was then. Because yeah. I know it was between that and then there was another show that we played at a club. I, I, I couldn't even tell you what's there now. It, it was right on Kingsbridge. It was right off the train. And that was the, the archway. The archway. Uh, I don't remember if we had now. played that show first and then recorded or yeah. we had already had the official demo out. I don't think we had the demo out, to be honest. <laughs> so mm -mm. No, I don't think so either. I think you're right, bro. I think we played that, that club. My time. God, it was like that was a, a Latin club. Yeah. So <laughs> we went in there, all our family, friends, everybody's there. But I mean, I can't tell you the looks that we got afterwards, you know. So <laughs> I was, I was, I was gonna ask y'all what what y'all's family thought of uh, thought of the music. <laughs> Mine was uh, there. Little... Cousins, maybe, but you know, yeah. Aside from that, maybe my baby brother, you know. Yeah. Maybe. Um, my mom, forget it. You know, I mean, she's, yeah, she definitely wasn't one of those, oh my God, you know, satanic music. She just <laughs> was really never into metal at all. Sure. My mm -hmm. father thought I was losing my mind because he's like, who the hell listens to this? Who thought of this music? Who created this? Like, you know, what's, what, what's the purpose of this? Yeah. Um, my grandmother had already passed and I really wish you would have, you know, saw that because, uh, you know, she was always really supportive no matter why. You know, yeah. I, I know she would have said, you know, uh, I got to uh, send you to Bellevue. But at the same time, she would have been like, hey, <laughs> if this is something you want to do, you know, I, I support you 110 percent. But I mean, as far as friends and relatives and everyone, oh, they, they were just really supportive. But I, but I know in the back of their mind, deep down, they were like, hey, this is not going to last long. They're going to play a couple of shows and. You know, probably bullshit, and then that's gonna be it. But yeah, li little did they know that 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 certainly wasn't the case. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, Jay, Jay, do you already mentioned earlier? You know, like some of the some of the kids that you well, you know, knew from the junior high, but didn't see too much. That had like you know the the whole look with either the MC uh, jackets or denim vest, etc. Did you have a kind of metalhead look that you were going for um, while you were in Hellbound, uh, you know, early years of Hellbound? You know, something I, I, you know, I had an MC. I was really never one to like, you know, I love the music. It was always in my heart, but I was never one to like dress in black every day. Sure. I know that the, all my friends at the school used to call me one of the trench coat mafia because <laughs> I always had like three or four different trench coats. And they're like, damn, why do you love trench coats? And why do you love, I mean, it, it was just really kind of all I had at the time and, you know, really couldn't afford really nice stuff. You know, sure. a lot of the guys in my neighborhood, whether they were the, you know, the drug dealers or into gangs, they, you know, had really nice, like, Sherpas, sheepskins and Sherlings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they always had their shellhead Adidas and, mm -hmm. you know, all different kinds of sneakers. And, you know, definitely those were things that I, that I always wanted, but, I mean, at the same time, I i mean, I got to be honest, it was whatever I could afford, whatever hand-me-downs I had at the time. And right. <laughs> um, so I really can't say really I had like a metal, metal look. It probably started getting a little more metalish. I probably say when the band started, because now I had to grow my hair. Yeah. So I was gonna ask now I started again, growing yeah. the hair, started wearing some more metal shirts and, uh, you know, try, trying to get ready because now it was like official. Now we were like a band. Uh, people in the underground started knowing about us. And, you know, I was giving everybody the heads up that, hey, a demo was coming soon and get ready. And I wanted to make sure that, 
yeah, I wasn't hitting the stage with, uh, you know, looking like uh, Inspector Gadget with the trench coat. <laughs> So so let, let's talk some about uh, apocalyptic visions. I, I listen to Transcend the Flesh on a very regular basis. Apocalyptic visions, I, you know, listen to every now and then, but I listened to it again, you know, earlier today. And it just, yeah, I mean, both both those demos, apocalyptic visions and Transcend the Flesh, blow my mind every time. But but talk about talk about apocalyptic visions. I, lo I love I love those demos so much, but want to hear what you all have to say about apocalyptic visions. Hey, Lou. Apocalyptic Visions um, is as raw, raw, raw as it gets with us. You know, that was the that was pretty much the the very it was you know that that beginning sound, so to speak, like the it, you know the birth of our sound. Yeah, I want to say that's when it was born, man, because um, it's super unique, it's super fast. You know, it's got a lot of a lot of influences in there. If you hear it, you know. It's yes. fast. It's got it's it's got grooves in it. It's got your know, mosh part, whatever. But it is super, super, super raw. The, the rawest version of, of Hellbound on record. You know, aside from the, the the tape that 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 we did and and Jay distributed. I like. I, I think I may be inclined to like that one more just because it's it, it, of the roots of it. You know what I mean? The the, the sheer beginnings are, are, sh are shown there you know this is this is us in the very beginning and you know true to form and as as far as the songwriting process goes was it the same kind of organic you know almost instantaneous uh process for the songs or are, are some of the songs the same as were on the original the original demo or all new songs in uh, apocalyptic visions yeah that's a better question for jay because i mean i think i think they're i think they were I think a lot of that was just a, 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 an elaborate version of the, the, the first, the yeah. very first raw thing that, that he sent out. But I mean, you know, if, if, if people were bugging out on it, I mean, they were yeah. really tripping on it. It was like the sound, the sound is so different, so unique. And we were like, hey, man, we got something, here, you know? And so, yeah, I, I, I lean, I mean, I love Transcend the Flesh. It's like the, 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 the improved version, like, can see us grow in, in that yeah. in the demo, but you know that the rawness, the rawness of, of ap apocalyptic is just it's just got its own thing, man. Really, yeah. really, yeah, it does. yeah, it does. yeah. That was a that was a fun time, man. I yes, I remember, if I'm not mistaken, Scott had actually found the studio, and of all places, it was in Staten right. Island, and I'm like. <laughs> Why the hell are we going over there? My God, we got Manhattan, which has like <laughs> nine billion studios, you know, the Bronx. But we ended up going to Staten Island. And he found these two guys that had never, ever produced or just was even into anything, thrash, death, the black, etc. And we were just like, hey, man, you do what you got to do. Because, of course, we're versions to this. This is my first time in a recording studio. I yeah. couldn't tell you anything about this uh, and everyone. it was just a thing hey man we were just why 20 21 years old we mm -hmm. went in there we just we just ripped it out and i just remember just sitting there when the guy was playing it back and he's like all right you know listen to this before we start mixing and everything and i i was just tongue-tied i was like literally shell-shocked and i'm, I'm kind of like looking at the guys and i'm like saying to myself like wow like we actually did this like yeah. this is us exactly the thought yeah this is us. And, is that us? Oh my god! And bringing that that tape back to the block, oh, and when really? everybody heard that at first, they didn't even think it was us. Yeah, they were like you guys but are bullshit. Are you? They they were blown away. They they <laughs> just couldn't believe it. They're like, "Wow, you guys like really did this? Like you really went into a studio?" And Lou, if I'm not mistaken, my God, we were on what? That was like what a three hundred dollar budget. I think less than that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I think we more for the for the freaking reel to reel to take home that we did for the recording. Crazy. Wow. And yeah, and that's that what that's cool. what started it. We were gonna go out of our way and we were gonna get uh you know professional covers and tapes done. And I said, nah, you know why? We can't afford it, we can't do it. So it was back to Radio Shack for the three packs and we were just Mm -hmm. copying the demo covers and that was it we were basically just giving them out for free i didn't care whether it was the underground people in the street i used to leave 
demo tapes in record stores, trains, buses. I I mean, I, I just didn't care just to get the name out. And uh, yeah, that, that was it. First official Apocalyptic Visions, 1991. Wow. And who did, who did the uh, artwork for the cover for that? If you remember. That was actually a, a friend of mine that I went to school with. Um, I heard he's somewhere around. I mean, I haven't talked to him in God knows how long. His name was Matt Labuda. And oh, he was he actually a talented too. kid. You know, he liked to draw. He was actually into the same type of music as uh, us. Uh, I don't know where his whereabouts are now. I mean, I heard he's still alive, believe it or not. Um, I would love to get in touch with him uh, soon. Just to uh, you know, just to say hi, but yeah, Matt Labuda, he was the matter of fact, he lived he lived on 225th, right around the corner from the train, from the one train. He lived like up that street. Okay, yeah. I used to live up that street too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um that's cool. so, from the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm a little a little further north now, but um okay. like in the two thirties, but um but yeah, um that's one of the things that blew my mind whenever I uh, saw on maybe it's on both of y'all's demo, but um, demos, but uh, the address. I'm like, oh, oh, shit that, you know, <laughs> the address was listed. It was at the exterior street, uh, you know, Marble yep. Hill Houses address. Yep. I thought, wow, that's crazy. Yep. That's crazy. Um, Projects. That's right. But uh yeah. Uh, you know how many times I said I have to tell the guys downstairs, you know, don't f with my mailbox. Like I have important things in here, like seriously, because I don't have to tell you they, you know, break into people's mailboxes. How you know? And I'm like, yo, guys, I don't ask you for shit, you know, but do me a favor, go sell your drugs, do what you want, don't mess with my mailbox, please. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so after y'all made apocalyptic, um, uh. Did you all start playing a lot more shows? What was it kind of like as far as the the shows that were going on at that time with y'all? Yeah, we played yeah. a bunch of shows. We, uh, I don't know if this was at the time where there was a promoter in the city. His name was Thomas Pasquale, and he basically ran a lot of the death metal shows, or the extreme metal shows, etc. And yeah, we got on some some pretty good bills. They may not have been packed to the gills at the time, but the bands that we played with were really, really good. Definitely influential as far as whether it's the New York scene or the death metal scene. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, we didn't play a lot, a lot. I can't say that we were out there like once a month and we were playing all over the place, but we definitely did travel. We, you know, we did some traveling, uh, you know, played Manhattan, uh, played the Bronx a little bit. Until finally, the Bronx had a couple of clubs, and that was right around Transcend. So I'm, I'm ahead of myself. But yeah, we played with a bunch of bands. We had a freaking great, great time. Uh, took a little break, Lou, if I'm not mistaken, before Transcend. Mm -hmm. I think, I think we did. Yeah, I think we did. Just you know, busy adulthood, you know. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. Trans Transcend was what, like '94. Five Somewhere around there, ninety five. Okay, five. Yeah, yeah. I see. Uh, yeah, that that I I could say once Transcend came out, that's when things really started taking off of the band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but y'all got y'all TVs that got us into Lamours. We did a show in Lamours. It was more like of a ba a battle of the bands. Yeah, in Lamours. Remember, <laughs> remember that fight, Jay. <laughs> Oh my God! Yeah, that matter of fact, that's when we we we, we first started a battle of the bands. Yeah, we went out to Lamores. Wow. Yeah, I'd say yeah. When Transcend came out, that's when the Wetland show started to come. We got on. Uh, mm -hmm. They did it for a few years. They stopped after a while, but they called it Death Stock. So oh, okay. right when Transcend came out, we got on that bill, and everybody was on that bill from Cannibal Corpse, Immolation, Dying Fetus, um. CB's, you know, was coming up then. Uh, mm -hmm. The Underworld, The Bank, mm -hmm. um, bunch of clubs that we just played in Manhattan, and then the Bronx. That's when the Depot opened up. Uh -huh, yeah, um, yeah. I can't think there was one more club. The one on Bainbridge. Oh, the Black Thorn. There you yeah. go. 
Boy, I tell you, the now I'm ashamed. Look at that. You remembered it, and I couldn't even think <laughs> I know, that's why. It's all very fresh in my mind because I'm you uh, know, <laughs> hearing everyone. But, yeah. So, oh, yeah, the Blackthorn. Yeah, we played a bunch of bands. We played with some hardcore bands, yep. uh, death metal bands there at the Blackthorn. Uh, yeah. Matter of fact, our, oh, our last show ever was at Coney Island High, and that was another club in Manhattan that was like – I'd say for two, three years, they had tons, tons of bands uh, roll through there. And we played a show with Crisis and, oh, man, I can't even remember the other band. But that was our last show in 90, 97, late 97, maybe, Wait, or late 98. Okay. Wow. Mm -hmm. Um and as, as far as the Bronx shows go, I mean, you mentioned the Depot and, and Blackthorn. Do you remember the names of any of the, like, early, like, one-off ones that you, you might have played in, like, the early 90s? I know we played some, with some Bronx bands. That yeah. I remember, whether it was Go to Mentees, Driven by mm -hmm. Hatred. Yep. Oh, God, I'm, I'm forgetting a couple of the Bronx bands right now. I know Lou will, will definitely remember them, but. No, I don't. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to write the brain, trying to remember them. I'm like, the ones that I remember, you just mentioned. <laughs> Which <laughs> boys, you know, we became friends and they were pretty cool. Um, Yeah, they, they everybody wanted to start like a Bronx, uh, what was it called? BDC type oh, of BDC. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were y'all a part of that? You know something? And I, I don't know how Lou feels. And I know we've talked about this, but this was like many years ago. Um, Hellbound was kind of an outcast. Yeah, yeah we were. You know, Only we were because, um, and I know I probably had mentioned this to you before in an earlier phone conversation. We weren't death metal enough for the hardcore death metal kids. Uh -huh. Then we go and play a thrash show. We were too deafy for the regular yeah. thrash kids that were into the Metallicas and the Testaments uh -huh. and the Exoduses yeah. and the Megadeths. Uh -huh. Then we would play hardcore bills, <laughs> and people were looking at us like, what are you guys doing here? You're like, you have nothing to do with hardcore. Yeah. We didn't care. Yeah, we, we never boxed ourselves in. People used to make comparisons, whether it was Sepultura, Creator, Sodom, Morbid Angel, whatever the case may be. But when we did interviews, we never sat there and said, we would say, oh, yeah, we have death metal influences, but we listen to hardcore, we listen to punk, uh, you know, we listen to, you know, hip hop, Everything. merengue, salsa, whatever the case may be, uh -huh. which was taboo at the time. You know, they look at you like you're a poser. You know, they think yeah. you come out the womb listening to Cannibal Corpse, and that's what <laughs> you listen to. And I said, listen, exactly. we're from the Bronx. I mean, we listen to everything. I mean, there's yep. no way that we're going to sit there and just listen to metal every day. That's yeah. right. So it was a thing where, yeah, a lot of bands, and I'll be honest with you, we would be on bills, but they wouldn't gravitate towards us. We never played with a lot of, like, there were a lot of bands that would play with each other, like, hey, we'll play another show in two months together. Or, hey, let's go hook up. And it was just never with us. We were just like the... You know, oh, they're not heavy enough. They're not gory enough. They're not death enough. So therefore, so there yeah. was things that we knew, and we would, you know, play shows with them, and and you know, definitely keep in contact. But at that time, with the New York death metal scene, there wasn't a lot of bands that would, you know. But the great thing about it was that the big magazines, the the big publications that really mattered, they loved us because. While a lot of bands were conforming at the time that were death metal, now they want to be black metal. Hey, let's throw on some makeup, we'll play faster, and now we'll just reap the benefits of the black metal scene. Or just a lot of bands that were just generic death metal, and then they just turned into they want to be Cannibal Corpse. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we kind of stuck to our roots. We grew up with uh, a lot of the mid to late 80s stuff, which Lou mentioned before, whether it's the German scene with Sodom, Destruction Creator, whether it was the uh, Bay Area scene with Dark Angel, Death Angel, you know, Testament violence. Huh? But we had our own things. And it was at a time where, I know Lou mentioned about Sepultura, where this is one of the first probably extreme thrashing metal bands that we heard that were like kind of funky. They had their own yeah. sound, you know, especially like with the drumming. Absolutely. You know, and, you know, something like a lot of metal bands, they were just kind of like basic and just upfront with their stuff. Or like we would like to say, they were really stiff with their drumming. 
Yeah. yeah. So when I had saw Louis for the first time, and he's like putting hip hop beats and tribal beats in the middle of parts and stuff, I'm like, oh my god, this is. <laughs> I mean, my guy, I just was just fucking blown away. I mean, basically, Absolutely. and. So, yeah, we were kind of like shunned a little bit in all honesty. And then there was just a time in the scene where we were passing a lot of bands in the city. And now you got other bands that are kind of jealous because now yeah. we're getting um, show uh, titles over them. And then we started getting paid money, which we didn't care about because most of the time we didn't even take the money. Yeah. But you would have bands now that would come to us and say, hey, I don't understand why you got paid more than us. And I'm like, well, why are you complaining to me? Go talk to the promoter. Like, yeah, this is not sure. my problem. For sure. For sure. Are there are there bands, whether, you know, in the Bronx or New York or outside of New York that you that you all were like close to or that you enjoyed playing with, um, you know, more so than other bands? Yeah. Crisis. Crisis was pretty unique in their way. Yeah, and we liked them. They, they were so different, you know, so different. She she was pretty artistic, how she yeah. performed. That was pretty cool as well. Um, and she was a sweetheart, you know, Karen Crisis. She's a sweet girl. She she tried to give us as many opportunities as possible. She loved us. Yeah. You know, I mean, when when she found out that the band was kind of not doing anything, she she um she actually reached out to me and she asked me, would I be the drummer for Crisis? Because the drummer was was departing. Wow. And I was like, nah, you know, I guess I was kind of holding on to hope that, you know, that we would remain. But, you know, um, they I don't think they exist anymore. Do they, Jay? No, they don't. Uh, they I know. Don't. I don't know where Karen lives. I have her on Facebook and off Sol. I know off oh, Sol's yeah. down in Florida and I don't know where Karen is, to okay. be honest. I know she, like, wrote a book last really? year or a couple of years ago wow. yeah they're not together still no they ended um, up yeah breaking up I, I maybe right around the time when we are disbanding believe it or not maybe like awesome. another year after and then pff, wow that was it but yeah much much love to crisis because yeah, they love they loved on us and we loved on them and they, they kind of looked out for us you know oh and yeah good you know yeah, that was at a time where it was uh I say CBGBs wasn't like a place they would have like death metal shows every once in a while, but it wasn't yeah. really like a, a hotbed for death metal. You know, a lot of punk hardcore and a lot of metal bands, but it was at the time where transcend came out and we were getting really good reviews in these major mags. Now, granted, yeah, we were still playing shows in the city, but it really wasn't like really big, big shows. I'd probably say the wetlands at the time was one of the biggest shows we played. And I saw the guitars from Crisis just said, hey, listen, man, you guys are really good. Everybody talks about you around the city. Um, I want you guys to come play CBGBs. And he put us on like Saturday night bills. Like it wasn't a Wednesday night where you're only going to have like 70 people in the building. Um, you know, he believed in us and that opened up the door. And, you know, I I can't thank him enough for that because we probably played some of our most memorable shows there and yep. it, it was it was definitely an experience to like the sound be in that everything. iconic club and just you know play that stage to packed houses i mean yeah. there was one show we played lou where people were just coming there was like one guy that came to see us from japan the so the show was sold out within an hour people were just pissed off they couldn't get in the building and wow. it was probably the one show where like we kind of like stamped our name into probably the city because after the show, people were just like so blown away and were like, yeah, like you guys are ready to like take that next step. Yeah. And it was probably, probably soon after that, where we were actually going to start recording for our album. And we were getting a uh, label interest at the time too, because you had a lot of the labels that were coming to the shows just to see what was going on with us. Mm hmm. So, so that that show you mentioned, uh, JD, that that was at CBGB's, the one that the that really st stood out to you, the one that was sold out like in an hour. That was CBGB's. Oh, I, I remember. Yeah. I was like, "Well, where's this guy? Where's this girl? I don't see anybody." <laughs> and I go outside, and everybody's like, "Oh, they they're, they're telling us we can't get in. The show's sold out, but it's only eight o'clock." Yeah, that's crazy. And I'm like, "Oh my god!" So, 
I remember talking to the guitarist from Christ and say, hey, listen, I'm not trying to sneak in 30 people in here, but there's like maybe like five people that have to be yeah. like here. And we actually got him in. And yeah, after that, we became a regular at uh, at CV's. Wow. Wow. That was packed and we played amazing that night. We were like looking at each other like, what the hell got into us? We played amazing. <laughs> amazing. There was nothing wrong with that show at all. Like we we usually finish a show and kind of critique our own selves. We just had nothing but smiles and you know, everybody was like, holy shit, man, we rocked this. You wow. know, we were, happy. we were real happy. Well, I was I was gonna ask you, Lou, but it sounds like maybe the answer is gonna be the same. I was gonna ask you what you know, maybe one or two of the most uh memorable shows are for you. Yeah, that would that would have to be one of them for sure. Yeah. I mean, when we played uh when we played that uh Lamours, was it Lamours when we we got into that fight with those guys, the other guys from the Bronx, quote unquote. Oh my God! Yeah, you know, matter of fact, bro, you know when that was? That was probably like either right before or right when Apocalyptic had just came out. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah was... we rocked that show too. Um. But you know, I think CB stands out the most. That was that was a good show for us. I mean, we we you know we went and played in a big stage finally, a big old stage. You know, <laughs> yeah, and we were like, look at all this space. <laughs> I uh, tell you, right? You know? Yeah, we had a lot of memorable shows. You know, we played. Uh, I remember, you know, us traveling to you know because Lou was like like the designated driver, him and Sky, because Lou had the van, and then you know Scott yeah. had that little station wagon, or he's the ball of his father's uh, mm -hmm. caddy. Man, I don't know if it was Long Island or Staten Island. We played a bunch of death metal bands. It was almost like in a restaurant. It was like all the way in the back. Oh, it was like, but the show was good. You know, it's funny, man. We I remember us playing shows with maybe like fifty people. I remember that one show at the Underworld. It was like human remains, pyrexia. It was like at the time, like like the top of the like the death metal bands that were just yeah. like making their bones in the scene. And I want to say it was a packed show. I mean, people did show up, but I thought that was a really, really good show. I was probably one of the first shows, first official like death metal shows that we fucking played. And I can mm -hmm. remember the guy from Human Remains, their manager was on the phone talking about that. He wanted to play shows with us afterwards, but like it never fucking it never came to fruition afterwards. And uh, the band yeah. ended up breaking up anyway years later. So yeah. I mean, you know, it was a, it was good, man. It was really good. It was a good run and Yeah, it was good times, like man. Times, you know? Like it's in the way. I mean, you know, we had our little stressful times and you know, times with equipment. Trying to get equipment down to shows, uh, yeah. you know, trying to run after work, man. And, yeah. man, I remember there were times Lou shit. And I know you did it, too, man. I remember straight from work with work clothes hitting the stage. <laughs> yep. Yep. And people were oh, like, what the hell are you wearing? I'm like, man, I just left work. Yep. I was a freaking dental assistant at the time. I got my freaking white shit on. <laughs> One of those bags with my clothes to change and shit and go, you know, go get on the stage. <laughs> quite a few times quite a um, few times so as far as uh, Transcend the Flesh goes did y'all record that in the same studio in Staten Island or what What, what studio did y'all record that in Oh, that was in Manhattan if I'm not mistaken um, and yeah I'll be honest with you and the guys knew it from the get go I mean I love the songs don't get me wrong Mm -hmm. That fucking production, my God. I think I can get better fucking production if I fucking swam to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> and yeah, and it was just a thing at the time where uh, Aaron, uh, I mean, he's, he, I, I love him to death. And he's a fucking amazing fucking guitar player. But he's stubborn and a pain in the ass. And he didn't want to get a new guitar. And that kind of affected the sound of the tape, of the yeah. of the demo, of the recording. And, you know, there's times that I just can't listen to it just because I just, you know, it kind of just blows my mind. I'm a little disappointed that, you know, that's the way that came out because we really worked hard on those songs. And like Lou said before, it was definitely a progression for the band. There were things in there that we had never done before. Uh, they really worked hard on the songwriting because I had nothing to do with that. I mean, I did all the lyrics. 
But as far as with the songwriting, I mean, those guys busted their asses. And, you know, I think that not not only the underground in general, but we deserved a better product. And, yeah, I was, you know, I was a little upset with that. And I know afterwards I was like, yeah, this is not going to happen again. I'd rather just not put out anything if we're going to have that sound. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, like I said, I love the music. And, you know, believe it or not, it really didn't get a lot of bad reviews as far as with the sounds, which I was surprised. I thought that was going to be the first thing that people were just going to rip from pillar to post. Yeah. Oh, as soon as I threw on the tape, you know, it sounded like 20,000 leagues under the sea. And, you know, <laughs> I'm turning this shit off right now and I don't want to listen to this. But I, I'm, you know, I'm I'm shocked, you know. But, I mean, it's definitely a tape that I'm, I'm proud of. Um, like I said, we really worked hard on that. Um, but it's just the production, the, the production just broke my heart and something that we talked about, you know, hopefully sometime this year, we're going to get back in that studio and we're going to re-record those songs the the way they were, you know, meant to be recorded. Wow. That, that'd be amazing. I mean, yeah, those, those songs are, I, I get some of those riffs stuck in my head for days on end sometimes. I mean, oh man, like, they hate say that. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, but but yeah, so after uh, Transcend the Flesh comes out and, you know, y'all are playing a bunch of shows, getting some great reviews and all, and you're working towards um, uh, putting an album out. Obviously, those songs were never recorded, but um, uh, what like what what did those the new songs that you were working on? Like, how did they sound compared to the previous songs that y'all y'all had put out? Was there a kind of progression in those songs too, or um, like yeah. what, if you remember? Yeah, I think I I believe there was a lot more musicality to them. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean it it was uh it was a little bit more elaborate, a little bit more thought over. You know, I I want to say, yeah. and lyrically, yeah, and lyrically too. I mean, lyrically, I mean, Jay got a little, you know, he still had the scream, but it was a lot more audible. You sure. know, you can. You can make out a lot of what he was saying, um, but we never did anything with them. You know, we we never had a chance. We never got the chance. We yeah. knew that we wanted. We knew we wanted to produce something way better than the other two productions, and so we were trying to make you know save our monies or kind of see where we were going to fund this from. But it just you know just never grew into fruition. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. And I, I remember like, when I went into the studio, and I, if I'm not mistaken, I hope Scott still has this. I think we recorded four songs. We never did vocals because we were just laying down some tracks. And I remember taking that tape home, and it was just at a time where I know in my life, it was probably the worst time. Um, uh, you know, I don't want to say personal problems, but, you know, my... My daughter was young. I was going through stuff with her mom. Uh, my dad was, I, I didn't even want to get into that. Yeah, it was just a lot of bullshit going on in my life. Uh, um, happens, yeah. And the sad thing about it was, was that, yeah, we did have label interests. We, I was keeping in touch with these labels and all they kept telling me was, hey, <laughs> when you have the finished product, send it to me and then we'll we'll sit down and talk. And, you know, yeah. I was really excited about that. And, but, I think it was just what they say. It was just the wrong time, especially I know in my eyes, I don't know how the other guys feel, but it was just so much going on in my life, whether it was just family, things that I had to take care of. And I really couldn't concentrate 100 percent on what I had to do with the band. And, you know, it kind of broke my heart. And, you know, it's one thing that I always told the guys, you know, if it's not us, I, I don't want anything to do with it. There's a lot of bands out there now where, hey, we're playing live and there are five piece and there's like one original member. And sometimes yeah. there's not even an original member. That's like right. I know there's a guy at my job the other day that said, hey, I'm going to go see Leonard Skinner. I was like, there's nobody <laughs> alive in that band. What do you talk like? I'm like, <laughs> you really going to go up there and see him? And that's one thing I always promised the guys. I said, listen, man, I'm not the guy that, hey, you don't want to be in the band anymore. No problem. I don't care. Yeah, we're going to go get somebody else. We always consider this as a family. We we fought as a family. We did everything as a family. And that's just the way it was. But it was just at a time of my life where things just weren't so great. 
and I just couldn't put my 100% into it. And yeah, it was, that was it. We just disbanded and, you know, we always kept in touch, but you know, that was it. And just to hear for many years, are you guys going to get back together? You guys going to get back together? It was just something I never thought about until, until recently, to be honest. Yeah, sure. Same here. I mean, you know, we, it, it was, uh, you know, you and I both, you know, we were in relationships, we were having kids and that's hard, man. It's hard to manage, you know, bands oh. take you away, you know, they take you away and you, you want to be the responsible dad, the responsible partner to the, to, to your lady, you know, so it's hard to juggle, you know, yeah. and when you're young, it's even harder, you know, you, you, mm-hmm. you can't, you can't really, your, your brain can't really kind of put it all together, you know, it's hard That's to true. do. And so, you know, the band becomes more and more secondary every minute. And so, you know, it, it happened the way, it, the way it, it typically does, you know? Yeah. I think, I think that if, um, if we were producing a little bit more, we would have stuck it out a little more. If we were active, you know, it, it, you know, even rehearsing, anything like that. But everybody was doing their own thing. Um, yeah, the band became very secondary until it was pretty much nil. Sure. Unfortunately. Sure. Um, now, this is a kind of uh, more... Um, uh, broad question and it might be a simple answer no it could it, or it could be you know a more elaborate answer but um it's one that i ask you know some of the bronx hardcore bands sometimes mm-hmm. uh, uh and i think you know it might be the first metal band is on you know it's only a handful of oral history so far yeah i think it's all hardcore bands until now but there's plenty mm-hmm. of more metal bands coming but um is there is there a bronx metal sound in your opinion, and if so, what do you think that sound is? If there, if if you if we have to label a sound a Bronx sound, and if anyone's gonna have it, it's probably gonna be us because everyone is like Jay was talking. Everyone else is kind of cookie cutting another band's kind of what they do, what they produce. You know, yeah. ours I think is pretty genuine. I mean, they, you, you can't even you can't even call us like Jay was saying. You can't call us a death metal band. We're not right. that sound. You can't call us a punk band. We're not that sound. You can you can probably call us a thrash band, but we're too heavy. We're a lot heavier than thrash band lyrically. Right. I mean, Jay Jay does what not a lot of people could do. The only one I could think of is is Millie from Creator. Yeah. You know, that's the sound I can think of. Um. I'm sure what I do is is a little easier to, you know, but vocally, I think Jay, for me, Jay makes the sound. Jay makes the band's unique sound. I mean, we all, um, you know, we all have our little piece in there, but Jay's voice is is pretty unique. I mean, I, yes. and he holds it and he, and he can do it with, with effortlessly. I don't know. Uh, who, who's giving me too much credit over here? <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to, bro. I got to because without, no, I think, like I always said, I, I fed off of you guys. You know, especially live. I mean, you know, you, you to me, you guys were just the backbone. When, when I saw you guys were ready and I looked into your eyes, I mean, that's that's all I needed. And yeah, yeah. you know, there were just times live that I used to say to myself, I said, God, man, I feel like just putting down the mic for a second and going into the crowd and let you guys play for two minutes just to really experience and see what these people are seeing. Because to me, I couldn't see half the time because my freaking hair was always in my face. So I didn't know what the hell was going on. Yeah, and, um, and to me, I always just, hey, I, you know, I never like stood in the house and like practice like, oh man, you know, the new Death album came out. And then like I say, I was in the shower and I was growling all over the house. It was just... A thing, hey, if I can do it and and maintain it, hey, great. But if I can't do it, then you know it's like, well, fuck it. Then I, you know, I just can't do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, it, it was. I mean, you guys. I mean, just sitting there during rehearsals, just Aaron coming up with the riffs. I mean, Lou just coming up with these like just sick drum patterns and ideas or things that I just never thought he could do, and I just like sit there and. I just like I just mind blowing. I just never thought in my 
wildest dreams that I would be with three other people that can actually play their instruments and just have the ideas that they had. And you know, I, I can, it was just a great time in my life. And I can't tell you how much I love these guys and how proud I am of them because, you know, they, they really did their thing. You know, it's crazy. All of us, every I think every bit of us have like musical education is almost nil because, like I said, when I was going to school, you know, whether it was middle school or high school, it's all different stuff anyway. And like yeah. the theory was very secondary, like I said. So everything that we, everything that I learned on, on those things, mm -hmm. I, I taught myself and so did Jay and so did uh, Aaron and so did Scott. So yeah. that's as raw as it gets. That's natural ability. And yeah. I guess that's how, that's how we sound so different. We weren't taught by anybody, so we don't sound like anybody. You that's know what right. I mean? We just picked up and, and took off and, and played what we felt like kind of thing. Yeah. It's, it, right. it, it, and, and you can tell the proof is in the pudding because when we came out with our first stuff, you know, you would think it would have followed like a cycle. Oh, wow, man. They're, they're all kind of like thrashy, deathy bands coming out of the Bronx. Let's do it. Certainly not the case. Everybody mm -hmm. wants to play hardcore after that. That's yep. right. Yep. So yeah. you, you would so, think after a while, like, oh, yeah, one of these bands would like, you know, be like a sub death, even like a death core type of band. Maybe they're out there now. And I really couldn't tell you because I have absolutely no clue. But mm -hmm. while we were in that scene, basically from like 91 to 98, I I can't tell you any type of bands that like sounded like us that came mm -hmm. from the Bronx and the scene. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, a friend of mine, rest his soul, John, that's why one day, we were, matter of fact, it was a show, I think we opened up for Voivod. Okay. And we were all hanging out in front of CBGBs and we're all talking and everything. And I don't know how it came up. Somebody was like, oh, you sound like this, you sound like that. And my friend John just said, nah, they don't sound like any of those bands. You know what they sound like? They're from the Bronx. They come from hard neighborhoods, this and that. They're ghetto metal. <laughs> and you know what that that always that stuck with me because i said you know what nobody uses that i've never heard that in my life yeah and i said you know what man we ever come out with shirts you know again or whatever yeah that that's definitely going on one of the shirts. wow Get that's metal. brilliant i mean i know i know y'all repped the bronx hard because like on on that one shirt jd you sent me it's i think what does it say on the back straight from the boogie down burial ground yeah. yeah, representing the Boogie Down Burial Ground. Boogie now, down. Yeah, yeah, you know, now people see that and they think, oh, yeah, we're a hardcore band or like a hip hop type of thing. But, you know, like I try to tell people, in the, especially in the death metal scene, which I don't understand, our darkness is different from theirs. Yep. You know, <laughs> ours is the streets, the gangs, the just the overall environment. And a lot of those bands, their darkness is upstate, in a graveyard or in the forest and I don't know what they, you know, do up there, but you know, that's why I try to tell them. It's like, Hey, you know, just because we come from two totally different worlds, it doesn't mean that, you know, we're trying to overcome the same shit. It would just, we just live in, you know, different places. So there was a lot of shows where people say, Oh my God, we know Hellbound's playing. Oh, why do you say that for? Because it looks like a hip hop show. Cause all of our friends yep. and family, you know, they're walking in, you know, looking like you know i don't want to say like yeah, a we got jerseys on and everything. Bronx yeah. look but like our fan we were walking and looking like vampires you know That's dressed right. in all That's black right. and rings and makeup you know everybody had their you know their bubble north faces on you know hats you know tilted to the side and their timberland boots and you know yeah. and it just wasn't a thing where we definitely weren't a bunch of poses this is you know we've been in the scene forever it's just hey man just from the place we came from, you know, we're just different. And yeah, we ain't trying to we ain't trying to wear black lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the one thing we never conform to the scene. No, right. no. Uh we came at a time where the death metal scene was rising, and whether it was in New York or overseas, especially in England as well. And a lot of the bands they changed. They were like, yeah. Oh wow, well, Thrash is not popular anymore. Oh, we're gonna go change. And that's one thing we never did. We never looked at each other. It was never even a second thought where we said, hey, man, let's start getting more gorier and let's just start talking about, you know, stuff in our songs that, you know, that eh, we didn't really care about at the time. Right. Um, and that's, you know, one thing I was proud of us. We, we stuck to our guns. We didn't care who was out there being the most bloodiest and, you know, goriest. And we did our thing. And the great thing about it, 
people people appreciated it and you know they really enjoyed it they were like wow you don't sound like anybody else out there and that's great because with all due respect to a lot of bands we would be on bills with 10 12 bands and if you would just close your eyes you couldn't tell one from the other yeah yep. absolutely um yeah. Beats all the same, you know, the stream all the same, basically. And it's like, yep. okay, do your yep. thing, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, JD, why don't you talk some about, um, are there particular uh, songs or maybe parts of songs lyrically um, that, you know, I guess expressed what you were trying to express better than, you know, any other songs? Uh. Probably, uh, I know an apocalyptic, probably uh, My Guilt of Silence. And I actually mm -hmm. wrote that, believe it or not. That was during the uh, the Giuliani years. Okay, yeah. With the frisk and stop and all uh -huh. that crap. And, and it was just getting to a point where this was like every other day. Yep, you know, yep. when I was coming home from work, you know, at the time I didn't have a, a, a bank account. So I was cashing my checks at the check cashing place. Yeah. You know, what are you doing with this wad of money? Or coming back from my girlfriend's house at three, four in the morning, and you're getting thrown up against a car, and you know where do you live, and then you know just you know after a while you just you just get tired of it because you're living in the projects as it is, and you you you're seeing the things that go on there. You're trying to better yourself. You you don't want to fall into those traps. You definitely mm -hmm. don't want to be a product of the environment. And you know, like Lou said before. I always try to stay out of trouble. Now, granted, I knew all the guys in the gang sold drugs, did whatever they want. And they were really respectful and cool because, like I said, I was just always into my sports and music and girls. But you just got tired of it. So now you're in that that box of the project. Now you walk out of there and it's like nothing changes or it gets worse. Yeah, you're late, so I always want to say, hey, man, you got a voice. You know, you say what you want. Um, You know, don't be afraid. Don't. You know, don't let these obstacles deter you from anything. You know, because I know a lot of people, they'll brush it to the side and say, hey, that's just the way life is. That's just the way the Bronx is. And it shouldn't be like that. You know, there's, there's a better life out there. Um, you know, even though you're going through your struggles, you know, uh, eternally. Um, but like I said, you, you have a voice to say what you want. And yeah, that 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 song definitely, uh, yeah. you know, hit home as far as with uh, Apocalyptic. I guess on Transcend, uh, Transcend was a little more complicated. So it was just like a lot of uh, probably a lot of fantasy. Uh, I mean, of my being, I know I had a lot of things that had to do with me internally. Um, but it was definitely like more towards like getting into the realm of like Clive Barker and Hellraiser. And yeah, yeah. it was just more of that. Uh, you know that like that fantasy like horror type of deal. You know, apocalyptic was just probably maybe a little more personal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my guilt of silence has got to be one of my favorite, if not the favorite song, is one of my uh, favorites. Musically, lyrically, it, you know, musically, it's got a lot going on. It's got a lot of changes. You know, I mean, it, it goes through the slows and the fasts quite a few times. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no lyrically, doubt. yeah. lyrically, he knocked it out of the freaking park. Because, I mean, it, it came from the bottom. You know what I mean? Absolutely. He let it go in the studio. I was, like, looking at him like, holy shit. You know? He let it out. He let it Absolutely. all the way out. He, I, I don't think he's ever reached that high note, you know, as the way, the way that he did it in that studio, man. I couldn't. I, I remember all the times live, Louis used to say, yo, Jay, man, you got to do the scream. You got to do the scream, man. Apocalyptic. I'm like, man, I can't even do this anymore. I don't even know what happened. What the? <laughs> oh, man. Wow. Wow. And and to your point earlier, uh, Jay, like, you know, with, with that song, you're singing about, like, you know, real experience and, you know, all of the bullshit from Stop and Frisk. In New York mm -hmm. City. Meanwhile, you know, your your run of the mill death metal band is you know singing about you know decapitating babies. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like it's like it it sounds it sounds just so like comical when you put it in those terms. But it's like <laughs> like y'all's music is real, um, mm -hmm. you know. Like, and it's I think that's one of the other one of the 
one of the multiple reasons why it's so unique, at least mm -hmm. as far as um, you know, the metal genre yeah. go. It says yeah. something. It doesn't uh, just scream at you. You know, it says something. There's something. To, there's something to be said there. You know. Yeah. 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 He took good care of that, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, it was just, you know, like I said, the the, the New York death metal scene will, you know, will always be remembered. You know, the great bands that have come from there. A uh, few of those bands we became really good friends with, uh, especially one shout out to Will, uh, Will for Mortician, who yeah, yeah. was just a really, really great guy, hung out a lot. We played a ton of shows with them. Mm -hmm. um, he was always supportive and you know mm -hmm. he was really good friends with a lot of the New York death metal bands um, but he wasn't one of the guys that said hey well you know what since you're not like us or you're not like them that you know we, we can't hang out we can't chill we can't play shows together I mean he knew what we were about and you know he appreciated that because he even said himself hey man you know this is the stuff I grew up on too until you know I got mortician so you know, it's not like I could shun like the, the music that you guys play while yeah. the bands from the state, because, you know, I got to be real. Not a lot of death metal bands come from the city. You know, I can't yeah. really sit here and say, oh, yeah, Cannibal Corpse is from Queens. Uh, <laughs> you know, Immolation is from Brooklyn. And, you know, uh, you know, whoever Morpheus Descends, uh, Pyrexia, I know they're. Um, you know, upstate Long Island, sure. uh, asphyxiation. Um, I know immortal suffering and bands like that. Yeah, came later on. They came from like Queens and in the city, but yeah. you know, there's really not a lot where you can, you know, sit here and say, "Oh yeah, Brooklyn was like the hotbed for death metal bands in '92," because you know, about five of them came out. So it was kind of tough. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Um, so uh, I got. One final question just about the Bronx in general for you for y'all that I'll I'll ask you in a little bit before I do just want to give both of you the opportunity to add anything, whether about Hellbound or you know, earlier portions of your life um that you want to add now, you know, it, it anything that we haven't covered that that you might want to add um before the final question. Uh as for me, I, I can't come up with anything. You know, I think um I think we've covered a good amount. Yeah. Um, I mean, ask whatever you may want, you know, whatever you want. Yeah, sure. You know, if you want to ask a direct question, we can answer. But I can't come up with anything that, that I feel is missing or, you know. Great. JD, what about you? I love growing up in the Bronx. As much as it was a beautiful struggle and a lot of the things that I went went through i wouldn't change it for the world it definitely made me the person that i am today I did all that yeah no doubt um i know a lot of people that don't know about the bronx and it's sad and it's a shame it's just what they hear and see on the news and um yeah, i tell them the bronx stupid. has a lot of beautiful places and you really should go on google and see some of the things that i hear because besides yankee stadium i think this is the only thing that people outside of new york yep. know about Right. And what I tell them about the Botanical Gardens and the Bronx Zoo and Egg Allen Poe and the Historical Society and just all the other beautiful things that they have, they're like, oh, my God, I couldn't picture the Bronx being like that. And I said, you know what? When you come to New York, stop going to 42nd Street and just staying within that little thing and stop being a tourist and jump on the train for a half an hour, 40 minutes and go ahead to the Bronx. And you're going to see a lot of things that are actually going to surprise you and you you know may change your mind on that. Um, but I love the Bronx. Uh, that, that That is my heart and soul. No matter, I can move to the Ukraine tomorrow and I'm always going to have New York and the Bronx in my heart. Absolutely. And uh, Hellbound, we came at a time in the scene where our type of music, I don't know, I don't want to say like our type of music, but kind of the elements of me was kind of dying and we kind of brought it back and we kind of stood alone with that and we stood on our morals. And that's just something that I'll always be proud of. I'll be proud of the guys for that. We always stuck by our guns, whether it was shows, other bands, uh, you know, we have one prominent death metal band. I mean, these guys, I don't want to say they're rock stars now, but they've been around forever. 
And I knew their original vocalist, but they had win one time. And when we finally got our apocalyptic demo out, they went, they threw out the demo tape, like literally they like <laughs> chucked it in the garbage. Mm. And I called them out in the fanzine. And I tried to talk to them a couple of times to see like, what was the story about that? And I didn't understand. And I know yeah. there were some bands in the scene that didn't like that because they were a big band at the time. Mm-hmm. I didn't care. Like, I had bands that were bigger than them that would write us and say, hey, thank you for sending the demo tape. I appreciate it. We're just not into that type of music. Hey, yeah. fine. I respect your opinion. But to like literally the time that my back was turned, you threw that thing in the garbage and now you're going to get mad because I I literally said F you in a, in a mag that a lot of people yeah. read. And like I said, I tried a couple of times to talk to them about it and they, they just weren't hearing it. And I said, all right, hey, man, that's fine, man, because... You know, I know what happened and hey, that's just stuff you got to live with. But yep. it's just a thing of just sticking to my guns. And uh, we never conformed with anything in the scene, whether it was promoters, whether it was other bands. What band um, was this? Oh, my God. This was Immolation. Immolation? Oh, man. It was yep. them. It was their first album, man. The guys went to the streets, man. A whole bunch of them. Steve and George and a whole bunch of guys. They went to this club in Yonkers called Streets. Sure, sure, yeah. And, big one. and they had their uh, album opening, The Dawn of Possession. And I didn't know their original vocalist. I wrote for him for years until he got kicked out. But anyway, the guys went afterwards and they said, hey, man, I know you don't know JD. He used to talk to Andrew, their original vocalist. But hey, he has a band now. He wants to give you this tape. So now they're hanging out in the car. And I don't know if it's the two main guys that's old, they, that they're still in the band now. But yeah, one of the guys like looked at that tape and he just like chucked the freaking tape. So they come back to the block and they're like, yo, one of those guys went took that tape and they just like threw it in the street. I was like, oh, I'm like, wow, that's that's amazing. So yeah, I kind of shot them out in the mag and they found out about it and they got mad. And there was actually one time where Scott had rented a studio in Yonkers and they were practicing in the studio. And I said, oh, really? I said, I want to go up and say hi to them. Now, I saw a couple of the guys. They did shake my hand and everything, but they just didn't want to look me in the face afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, saw yeah. them a couple of years later at a Sodom show in upstate New York. They just didn't want to. And I said, look, I tried. You know, I just wanted to find out. I'd rather them just give me back the tape and just say, hey, listen, when I didn't see you guys, no disrespect. Hey, yeah. no problem. You know, yeah, I didn't see the product and chug it. Yeah, wow. but when I found out, and they said, oh, my God, we're in the car, we're warming up the car, and the dude just, like, took the tape out of his pocket and, like, chucked it into the, the street, and I was like, wow. 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 Well, uh, well, J.D., you you answered this kind of in, in uh, what you were saying uh, at first, uh, um, but I'll, I'll go ahead and ask it again, and then, and then, Lou, you can answer, too. What does the Bronx mean to you? The it means Bronx? everything to me. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. It was my life. It, it, it's what we know. You know, it, it's like what we knew for a great portion of our lives. You know what I mean? And, and I mean, I wouldn't change growing up there. I wouldn't change being born there. I wouldn't change any of it. I mean, I have a, a certain amount of pride of being born in the Bronx and surviving the Bronx and such and such. But and people would talk all the crap they want about it. You know. Um, we're kind of labeled a certain way there there's a stigma whatever you know some of the greatest people you ever met will come from this place you know and there are no prejudices there are no most people in the bronx you know they don't have any prejudices they don't they, they don't prejudge they you know if you're a good person that's great if you're a bad person we'll keep going that way you know um not oh my gosh you're from the bronx i can't even mess with you no you're like you're from the Bronx. You you know you know yeah I'm from the Bronx. I say most of the most of the people from my neighborhood are good people. You know yeah. what I mean. And everyone that comes from the Bronx is is looking to do dirt. Yeah. And so they, they they say yeah I can see that in you. You're 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 an example. And I take it as a compliment I guess. But you know give it a chance. You know you 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 listen to the stigma. You, you listen to all the crap talk. I mean, Pacino is from the Bronx, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All these people that are that are mean something to people born here, you know? So it, there's no there's no other place I, I would rather be born, man. I mean, I, it, it makes you strong. It makes you smart. You're street smart. 
you're not scared or anything, you know, you, you learn it, it, you know, the atmosphere is rough, but you, you don't look at it that way. You, this is a norm to you, you know, it's got as good and it's got as bad for, for, for me. It was mostly, mostly positive, you know, po a positive influence. Yeah. You know, and I wouldn't change it. I would not ever change it. I'm proud of that. I'm super proud of that. You know, I wear it all over myself. <laughs> kind of thing, you know? <laughs> the graffiti, all the crap. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Katie, what about you? That does. It means everything to me. It's definitely molded me into, uh, you know, into the man that I am today. I mean, I Lou hit it on the head. I the the. The stigma of the Bronx, it's all you hear are through my journeys. And I've lived in Texas and upstate New York. And the first thing people would say, oh, my God, the Bronx, crack and, and death. That's all people would say all the time. And I would sit there and I would say, hey, do you see my shirt right now? Ralph Lauren? Yeah. I said, you know, he's from the Bronx. Oh, my God. No, he's not. And I said, oh, yes, he is. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I would never picture that. And you just start talking about things and. You know, people got to realize the Bronx is a beautiful place to me. And I know it has its rough areas and it has its crime like everywhere else. Yeah. But it's one place where I say to myself that I think if I lived somewhere else, I wouldn't be the person that I am. You know, I, I was, yeah, you know, I was never the one skittish person. Yeah, there was other neighborhoods that maybe we didn't get along with that you were kind of leery to go in like, Hey, listen, you know, I know we got beef with this certain building or this certain Avenue, whatever the case, but you know, I, I never walked the streets in fear. Um, you know, always, I just try to embrace the borough. There was just so much to do. Uh, just so many beautiful people, the cultures, the, the food, the music, the atmosphere, the, the jams in the park, uh, Yankee Stadium, I mean, monuments that you can go to that I think people don't appreciate or they just take for granted just because of the Bronx, because they just don't think of the rich history and tradition that we do have here. Absolutely. Uh, I embrace it till the day I die. Um, I love just going to other places and they hear my New York Bronx accent and they know right off the bat where I'm from. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like I said, I, you know, and that's one thing that we did with the band. We, you know, we wanted to be that band from the Bronx. We wanted people to say that, wow, it's predominantly hip hop and Latino music. But wow, mm -hmm. there was this one band from the Bronx that actually made a, a little noise in the music industry and you know they they did all right for themselves you know it just was a shame we didn't get to see you know what happened afterwards but you know we could say at least we had a little part of history as far as the um you know the heavy metal uh music scene in the bronx absolutely absolutely you did well uh thank thank you both so much um for sharing so much about uh, your own lives about Hellbound. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now. Okay.